I'm Charlie Barnes, afternoon radio personality with K99 here in Northern Colorado. Like many of you, I believe we live in the greatest country of all and have never taken my freedom for granted. In this continuing weekly video series for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, I'll be sitting down with our local veterans from World War II to present conflicts to document their life stories for future generations to see and hear. I believe it's important for their stories to be told and never forgotten. We live in the land of the free and home of the brave because of them. These are their stories. Okay, from officially for the record, um, this is a, uh, another interview for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and uh, we have the honor today of uh, uh, being here today with Mr. Ronald Britton, uh, United States Army Vietnam veteran. Uh, my name is Charlie Barnes. I am conducting the interview today at my home in Greeley, Colorado, and our videographer again is Mr. Drew Blankston from Star Painter Productions, and we thank him, uh, of course, for his service as well. Um, Mr. Britton, Thank you for being here today. It's uh, it's an honor to sit down with uh, with any veteran. Um, uh, I have the utmost respect for for veterans from any conflict, but I think probably none more so than the Vietnam guys, just uh, for the obvious um, way that turned out. And uh, let me start by saying welcome home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to the beginning and uh, let's find out who you are. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your parents, uh, your mom and dad, um, what were their names, uh, where were they from, what did they do, a uh, little background on your folks. Sure, that would be my pleasure. Uh, uh, I was born here in Denver in uh, 1946, and my parents uh, prior to that uh, had done different things. My brother's four years older than I, and uh, he was born in Baltimore, but they they came back here for uh, uh, whatever reason, and uh, this is where I was born in Denver, down south of here. Um, some of the early things I remember, Charlie, and uh, before I mention that, thank you again for your comments in the preface of this uh, interview. It's, it's well taken, and no one could say it and mean more than you do when you do, do say it yourself, and it's received in that tone and it'll be kept in that manner. Thank you for what you're doing now and your effort and interest for our country. I think that uh, veterans uh, can all unify in one thing, and that is that we are unified if we just find each other. Mm -hmm. When I was very young, I would play Army, like other children, I guess, but sometimes to the extent more than others. Uh, I always enjoyed sports, uh, when I was less than five years old, I would be throwing the baskets uh, to the hoop for a free throw, practicing those endlessly, while the college students nearby would come by and watch and see, uh, kind of marvel, if you will exaggerate some, at the little boy being able to throw it that high. And, uh, well, that was from a lot of practice, and, right, and mostly from a lot of desire and interest. Uh, we develop at a very early age things that I think are meaningful to us. I did. Uh, some of those for me were the importance of my family. That was most important because uh, we were most relevant to each other and cared a lot about each other and it was evident even as a small baby like that. My parents gave me the luxury of sharing adult conversation with me, the kind of who's going to be elected, uh, Eisenhower, is he all right, etc. Political tones, even the bomb. And I was curious about the bomb and what it left us with. The little you can comprehend, maybe sometimes that's good because you can only comprehend a little mm -hmm. and have less to base a decision or interest in. Uh, from Denver, uh, we moved to a small town in Illinois, about 1,300 people, I think. One where, whenever you want to know where somebody was, just ask your neighbor because mm -hmm. everyone knows. And in a lot of ways, that's real good. And how old were you when you moved back to Illinois then? I was moved back there when I was six years old and into the first grade. And your folks again, just so that we get to know them a little bit. What were their, what was your dad's name? Thank you for reminding me. My dad's name is Raymond Britton. 
Uh, and your mother? And my mother's name is Esther Britton. What, what did your dad? What was your dad doing for a living at the time? What? Uh, where, where? Where was the income coming from? What did he do? He was at the time uh, working on his education at the University of Denver, the Denver University. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, he was working uh, as a manager of some sort. I don't remember exact title in uh, uh, maintenance of that section of uh, the university. So they're hand, hand in hand while he was getting his further education. Originally he graduated from sixth grade and back in those days he was born in 1905. Okay and in those times it wasn't necessarily common to go beyond sixth grade right. and it surely wasn't convenient to go to college mm -hmm. and less opportunities. He was an educated man because he was self-educated and with that then he learned the value of formal education and that he pursued further at DU until he had a degree. And with that then he went to work for uh, a company called Frontier Airlines, but uh, the owner of Frontier Airlines, Bud Maytag, and his brother who owned the uh, washing machines and so forth, uh, as a refueling manager. Uh, we went to a small town, like I say, in uh, Illinois. And uh, there he showed me the luxury of seeing the different planes inside them even at times, learning about the operations with the, what the Minutemen were that could be in the air within a minute to protect our country. Mm -hmm. Things like this that were interesting and important to anyone if you're interested to know it will absorb. Mm -hmm. With me it was important and stayed. My mother, uh, she was uh, born in a small town in southern Colorado. No, excuse me. That's where she grew up. She was born in, uh, in Arkansas, where they moved to a small town in, in uh, southern Colorado. And there grew up in a tiny school where everyone was in the same class. She there had an interest in sports, and particularly basketball. My father uh, played minor league baseball at that time with the Texas League as a pitcher and a, and a shortstop and a switch hitter. And, uh, the most thing I can say about them both uh, is they were, in my observation, completely successful with people. They taught me the value of closing my mouth and opening my ears and opening my mind and, and turning it around and then waiting to absorb more and put that together. But giving me the opportunity to be treated like a human being instead of a child. And so that was a tremendous help. And they did that for other people, too. I never saw them speak illy of anyone else. My father always taught me, if you're going to speak ill of someone, have something good to say about them, too. Sure. And if you're going to have a problem, you suggest to somebody, hey, this is wrong, then have a correction mm -hmm. and be willing to do it. You know, and from what I know of you, I think that uh, that's quite evident in uh, your later life, uh, even as we get into your Vietnam experience, I think that um, um, I think that portrays uh, what your folks, you know, had taught you. I think that you obviously carried that through your entire life, you know, a, a lesson that you've never forgotten. Well, thank you. So, uh, in Illinois, you're a young kid. Uh, what are you doing? The, you know, are you, are you, did you always want to be a soldier? Was, uh, was the military something? Did you, did you, did your dad serve? Anybody uh, in your family serve before you? I mean, well, my grandfather was in the Spanish-American War on my father's side. My father at the time of World War II was doing some sign of uh, confidential work for the government here with, combined with the railroad and therefore he was not uh, wanted for the draft and they needed here. Uh, the uh, sports thing was always in his life, I think. He swam across the Mississippi at one time and he was challenged with sports and successful with it, as I mentioned. And he knew the opportunities that exist there if you allow people to be themselves without criticism, but advance with encouragement rather than rejection. Mm -hmm. And he would work with us endlessly, uh, ground balls to my brother and I. Uh, and speaking of your brother, who is your brother? Uh, excuse me, my brother, Don Britton four years older and uh, always has been a good example for me in my life. Uh, speaking of baseball, for example, and the relationship there, in the third grade I was asked to be the bat boy on his team. And one of the team members thought that was ridiculous for a third grader to be bat boy, so he chose to come over and tell me, you can't do that. 
during the course of a game. Well, my brother found out about that, and then he found this guy after the game and corrected his attitude. <laughs> and yes, I was there for the next game and, and encouraged to be. So he's always been supportive if it took that type of force or if it took the tolerance, I guess, to try and uh, uh, attain patience to teach me as he has. He's very accomplished uh, as a research scientist, as a, a neuropharmacologist, it took him considerable work, as anyone would know, to achieve that position, let alone do things while he was there. And with that, he's maintained kind of a family attitude of being universal in his activities, and not just uh, academics, but to be able to participate in sports and so on. So sports was obviously a very big part of your life growing up with your mom and dad being so active, and especially your father. Um, you guys were always uh, in, in, involved in, in, in sports in one way or another then. Correct. I would collect golf balls on the local country club in Illinois uh, from the rough and ponds and then sell them to the golfers as they went by. And my parents did not like, there you go, but also would play golf, of course, too. And at one point had aspirations to be a professional golfer. That was after the military. Prior to that, I wanted to be, uh, I wasn't sure. It's not that I'm skilled at anything I do. Uh, I hope I'm skilled enough to try and do better than I am now at whatever it might be. In sports, it always offers that opportunity. And growing up, I felt like that I would definitely be an athlete as a profession and have other things, business, whatever could be on the side, sort of, but initially sports. I didn't know quite what to select. I wasn't built uh, for size, maybe whatever else it might acquire for football, but it didn't interest me that much. And basketball was potential, but I decided not on that. So baseball and golf and tennis became my uh, choices at the hand, and I had a scholarship for, uh, C from CU for tennis waiting for me when I got out of college, when I got out of uh, high school. And, and before we get there, let's sure. get in. So you high school in Illinois then? Or were you no. back in Colorado when, where'd you go to high school at? In Golden, Colorado. So you were back in Golden when you went into high school? Correct. And you graduated uh, when? In 1964. 1964. And uh, so from that point then, again, uh, um, where did the tennis come into play then? Where, uh, where, was that just, just since high school that you had gotten into tennis? Yes, it was. Uh, I, my brother was into it and so I was encouraged uh, a little bit there, but decided to to go for that and uh, had uh, had very good success with that and uh, became a very good player. Obviously must have been very good to get a scholarship. Well, I, I was quite good and there were certain weaknesses in my game that were very bad, I'm sure, I can think of them too, <laughs> but the serve uh, helped me a lot. But uh, one thing I was not good at was uh, beating the coach at CU when I went up for an interview. Uh, we played for an afternoon and uh, I learned some then and uh, he accepted me, but in teaching him I was not there for that and he could return my serves, etc. Uh, so so was, this, was this a common practice then? I mean, uh, if, uh, had you received a scholarship before or do you, do you have to go and play the coach to be able to secure that scholarship? I went to see the coach and uh, secure that scholarship and then it was understood that after uh, high school then uh, and that was during the latter part of my high school and senior year. And then uh, it was understood that uh, the following year I would have the scholarship available at CU for tennis. I decided to go up to uh, CSU, Colorado State University, uh, to kind of prep myself for uh, more serious study as well as tennis. Because I really didn't try that hard in, in high school or before then in, in most subjects. Most subjects are fairly easy to at least get by, and then some that you're interested in, or it's easy to put more into it. I am certainly, I wasn't always successful at what I wanted, but I wanted to go up there and get more of, of a, uh, acclimated toward that uh, academic attitude. What, what was your ideas as far as uh, what you wanted to study? Uh, did, did you know at that point? Well, yes, I did somewhat. I, I know business was uh, going to be a secondary, and archaeology I had in mind as a potential primary, really? as a major, yes. 
I had an opportunity to meet a few people when I was younger. My mother had worked back to my mother at the Colorado School of Mines in the library where she met and helped a lot of people because she's that way, but had opportunity with books and where are things and conversation with people from the United States and foreign people too. Helping people is helping people. We're all people. So uh, the tennis came about uh, as a good opportunity because I saw that I was successful with it and I had a partner in doubles. We, I played doubles as well and we were undefeated in both as I recall and uh, so we did well together and our team did well together so that's part of what makes one do well individually. Uh, baseball was encouraging to me in, in, in Little League Baseball for example. Uh, I had my friends from sixth grade when we moved back uh, through junior high school and I was a pitcher primarily in shortstop backup and one day we were playing a game with some fellas in a nearby locality we were from Golden and the word got out as it does sometimes that uh, hey you guys don't have a chance against us well uh, they had defeated a 72 to 73 in a six minute quarter basketball game in the ninth grade but now they say that we don't have a chance in baseball. I'm pitching, so without the coaches' uh, awareness or anyone else except the team, I told them before the game, okay, when I go out to the mound, I'll take some warm-up pitches, and then when we start the game, uh, I'll wave everybody in. I want the left field to go to third base, center field second base, right field first base. Everybody sit down, except the, on the bases, just sit down. You won't have anything to do. Right. And, uh, yeah, right, Ron. We're with you. We, we had a good team. We trusted one another. And everyone sat down except the catcher, and he was already almost there, right? Right. <laughs> well, strike one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, for the first inning, there, might, there probably was a ball or two in there, I, or more, I don't know. But it was three outs real quick. No, no. Three up, three down. Right. Didn't touch the ball. And everyone was surprised, particularly that other team and, and our coach, too. And so I got away with it for three innings. And the coach said, no, you got to stop now. But for three innings, they didn't touch the ball. And part of that was because we, I had that confidence, but my team had confidence in me and I in them. We were a unit, and so my pitches as they were were, were our pitches. It was a team effort, but it was fun to do because it's fun to compete, particularly against people who say you can't. I, th I think they learned the lesson of uh, sometimes you don't add fuel to the fire. I think so. It was nothing but motivation for you, and obviously that's it's something you probably remember like that was yesterday. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And there's different things like that that stand out in, in golf, basketball, and, and, and whatever that seem like they're amazing and if you have that skill it must be constant and if it is you'll be paid more than anyone ever was to perform but of course it's not true and we choose i think i do to remember those maybe we call them spectacular things even though and they are even though they're rare but for me i had opportunity i'll assume you won that game yes <laughs> <laughs> yes um, so, you know, sports being such a huge, you know, factor in your life, um, you know, in the tennis scholarship, so how did that work? What happened there? Um, uh, I don't want to ruin the story, but I know that you didn't really pursue the tennis career, and uh, tell us why. We were at war. Whatever they chose to call it, people were there, and we all know we were, we're at war in Vietnam. And, and, and this again is to give us a time frame this as far as when you were at CSU and this whole sure. time frame. This, I graduated from Golden High School in 1964 and so it was that summer I went on up to CSU, summer of 64, and then I would have started in fall of 65 But uh, to see you. But we're at war. Uh, you asked earlier if I had always thought I'd be a soldier. Well, I did things that suggested that, I think like practicing how to do an ambush when I'm in the ninth grade. And my parents said, Ron, you're too old for that now. Well, I was by myself and I had uh, interesting problems. I would create up this little canyon, 
for whatever reason, I didn't giggle and laugh about it, but it wasn't as though I knew I'd be in the military. I mean, was, it, was a lot of it, though, you know, um, just something that you had in your heart, or do you think because of your grandfather and your father and, you know, and being a boy and you wanted to be like them, um, or was it just something you just always wanted to do? It was something that, uh, no, not something I always wanted to do. Uh, I think that we have wars so that we don't have wars. At least that's a real good reason and then we can draw on. Uh, no, I did not plan to be in the military. It always maybe was in the back of my mind if I would have to be or need to be or want to be. Growing up I was, you know, we were coming out of World War II, the mm -hmm. consequences of that, which I really didn't know of, but mm -hmm. that time frame and then Korea and so on. And uh, I felt loyal and due to our country. We have a country and Half the people who were born here could move, and twice as many that come here could be doubled. And we'd still have our country here because we have something that is worthwhile, something people have fought and died for, of course, but even not more importantly, but as far as importantly, they've lived for. They've lived for. I, by that I mean, like I told some children not too awfully long ago in school with a a presentation from what I received at the honor flight. I told them at the monuments in, in Washington, uh, they represented particular things like Army, Navy, Air Force, etc. But they really represent me too. They really represent our whole country. And they really represent you children too and for the things that you have loyal to your country. And that you, in a position that you are, are contributing to this country when you are nice to each other. And when you do things you don't have to do, but that help. He said, that's a contrib contribution to our country. That makes you part of the team that we have, just as much as everyone. They understood that in some way or another, but appreciated the words, and I think understood it verbatim. Right. And uh, that's how I feel. It's how I grew up, uh, with a loyalty to our country, to respect our country, and to respect the people involved in whatever capacity, military of course. Mm -hmm. But it takes more than military because we military is there to defend something and create something and things like that. Obviously, uh, you know the, these uh, um, values instilled, you know, from your parents at an early age, you know, um, definitely resonated, you know, all the way up to that point. So, 1965, um, you're at college. Um, you're at a uh, you're at a crossroads in life. Um, you've got a, a tennis scholarship. Um, you're looking at a uh, you know a future and uh, you know a, a possibly as an archaeologist. How'd you end up in Vietnam? Um, I decided that that's where I needed to be, in place of college, and that I could get back to college. This is just a conscious place. decision you had made that uh, yes. it was a, a duty to your country. Correct. Or were you drafted? Uh, you you volunteered to go to Vietnam, did you not? Well, actually, Charlie, it's all of the above. Uh, this is a, a daughter duty to my country. Uh, I was drafted, but the reason I was drafted is because I had decided that that's where I belonged, was in Vietnam. And so first step was to get out of uh, the process toward further education at that point in time. So I stopped that. My parents weren't exactly excited about it, but I stopped and was going to join I volunteered, I think, for the Air Force and, and Marines. I'm not positive about that, but two different ones. Both of them saying that we won't accept any volunteers, not only the Army will. And so I decided, well, uh, I'll just wait for the draft and see what develops. And if it's something I want to stay with, then I can always re-enlist. And the draft, meanwhile, two years should let me know what I want to do. So I did so. and. Uh, then with that, uh, our numbers came up alphabetically, and so you kind of had preparation a little bit. Mm -hmm. I worked building trailers, helping to build trailers for a manufacturer for, during that interim. And uh, they wanted me to leave early uh, so that I would have more time with my family, understanding that I might not come back. Uh, and maybe this is 1965, early 66? Summer of 64. This is still the summer of 64. Right. It's uh, and fall of 64, actually. 
because it was the because Vietnam had just you know for the record for uh, you know people who are who will watch this you know years down the road um, you know our involvement in Vietnam had not really yet uh, been heavy yet at that point had it not depending on how you look at it the various phases of it which I'm no expert at all on are involvement with Vietnam. But we're definitely talking about the beginning of the war here. Right, yeah. but where the beginning of the war was, in, in a sense, is when our country and other countries were in Vietnam recruiting the villages to go along with us. Okay? There's village here, here, and here. And there's the United States representative here, the Russian representative here, the Chinese representative here, for the main part. And then Okay, like musical chairs, let's switch. <laughs> and people went from village to village. I know because I have a relative who was involved in this. And they would try to recruit them with uh, enticements of security, with uh, being guarded, with education, food, and medical things. And so to get their loyalty, at the point in time when the Gulf of Tonkin took place, to my understanding, we pretty much had most of the villages obligated for one direction or another, which was either communist or the Western world. Because the Chinese and the Russians were largely working together in that sense of communism to convert and make Vietnam stay communist, starting with North Vietnam. From what I know, the North Vietnamese did not want them either. Anyhow, I decided that's what I needed to do, so I stopped the education and I waited for my draft worked while I did, was drafted then in uh, uh, December of uh, 1964, excuse me, December of 1965 is what it took. December 1965 and then December 67 would have been my uh, discharge. Uh, where'd you go to Fort, uh, or where'd you do basic training at? Basic training down Fort Bliss, Texas. What, what was it? What was it like? You know, when you know when your number was called and, and you knew you were going, um, you know, into basic training. You, you knew you were going to Vietnam at that point. Did you? Were you? Were you guaranteed you were going to Vietnam? Well, pretty much so because pretty much everyone was going to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't want to enlist so that I could stay here. Uh, I wanted to list so that I could participate in whatever was going on in Vietnam because apparently our government knew that we should be there, better informed than I and our most civilians. They had their point of view. Uh, you went into to did, did you know what unit you were going to be in um, as far as you know when you were in the army and you went to Fort Bliss? Uh, do you just report for assignment? How do you know exactly? Uh, did, did you what you want to be? Or did, infantry, combat, pilot? What I mean? Do did, did you get to choose? You know what what happens in that process? They determine uh, with the process of uh, physical tests that you take in and and at the end of your basic training too of a obstacle courses and so on to test your So you didn't request ability. for one specific thing or another, or do they let you? Well, not exactly, but what it is that uh, at the end of that you also take written tests. And uh, during the course I'm sure you take, we took some, but I was offered the opportunity to be a warrant officer, which is a pilot. And I asked them, well, is that going to be fixed wing, like an airplane? And I said, no, that will be helicopter. And I said, well, I don't really see something to do outside the military with a helicopter. So to sign up for four years instead of the two, it didn't seem like it was the thing to do. I wasn't aware of the extent of the involvement of helicopters in Vietnam, or even the potential today, I suppose. But uh, for that reason, I, I chose not to do that and uh, just kept the assignment they had given me, uh, which was infantry. And with infantry then, uh, I was sent to uh, Fort Ord, California. It's out near uh, Carmel. And, and you've uh, been in the service how long at this point then? Oh, it's, basic uh, training was done at Fort Bliss at this basic point? Basic training was done in uh, uh, two weeks uh, leave, I guess. You had two weeks, week and a half. And then I report for my AIT advanced infantry training in Fort Ord. Where there, basically, it was once in a while you'd learn about a mine, different 
things about different equipment. For the most part, it was running and jumping and uh, things like that. So it could have been more profitable and better directed at I better direct it myself. But I sort of stayed away from it because it seemed easy to learn the little bit that they seemed to be offering uh, so far as information and so far as the physical things I already knew how to run a job. And I was already inspired. So I wasn't real excited about where I was going to be, what I was going to do. I didn't know. Uh, infantry, yes. So after advanced infantry training, which took a couple of months, then uh, a, a small leave again, and I uh, went to uh, Columbus, Ohio, where the 199th Light Infantry Brigade was being reactivated. Uh, there we spent, oh, two or three weeks at least, uh, unassigned, and uh, would go out and pick up cigarette butts. Well, rather than go out and pick up cigarette butts, I went to the library and wrote about the things that I thought important to think of. Uh, things about people and I remember one thing uh, my uh, parents inquired about if I had come up with a, an article I had wrote of substance, a small substance, but titled uh, Man's Inhumanity to Man and they wondered where I had come up with that title and I had arrived at that through observation of different people through that time in the military and reinforced I guess through all the time prior to that. But more than any humanity to man is the comparison. To understand what's wrong you have to see what's right and vice versa I think. So I saw some of each and was interested in each and that's been one of my main goals in life frankly is to to learn about people. Not through a book. I, you could probably write ten of them and have more than to do. I would much rather spend three hours listening to you in person tell me of your experience, even though it wouldn't cover as much conceivably, it might still cover more. For me, it would more. And I find that uh, there are no ordinary people. We are all extraordinary and have little opportunity to share that. So I enjoy hearing that of others, and that helps me to hear from others what they're doing and helps me to learn. Was this philosophical uh, mentality of yours then at that point um, just something you'd always had or was it subconsciously a part of thinking you may not be coming home? No, I think I always had that. I'm sure I always had that. I've always been interested. One time uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Egypt, Nehru, Nehru was in Golden, was in a, giving a, a lecture to a uh, hundred or so people. And as I mentioned, my mother worked there at the School of Mines, and she knew of this, and she and I went there and uh, listened to that. And it was uh, interesting. And afterwards, she said, Ron, go on up and introduce yourself. I said, well, I'm kind of shy to do that. I don't, he doesn't want to talk. Go on up there, Ron. You know, see what he says. Introduce yourself. Tell him what you think. So I did. And we shook hands, and uh, he acted like a normal person if there is such a thing. Uh, but. Uh, was very glad that I came to say hello. Since then I've remembered that too, but that's one of the experiences that confirm that if you want to learn something, go to the source. If you want to talk to people, don't wonder if you can, ask them if they will. Take that time to take that initiative, which most people in my limited experience sort of shun from because they're not sure of the consequences. If it's business or just a social thing, a couple of my best friends, you know, it's the sort of thing, you get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So from Fort Ord, how do we get to Vietnam? Is it a, is, was it an overnight thing? Is it a two o'clock in the morning wake up call, get ready boys, uh, we're going? Um, what, 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 was, what was that like? You know, what was the anxiety level like? Let's, let's, uh, let's go to Vietnam. Okay. Uh, that was in my mind and the feelings of definitely going when I was already assigned to the infantry and so on. Uh, when I went to uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, there I wasn't sure of what would happen. And as I said, it took a while to get formed. When we did, I was given the opportunity to be a squad leader, a buck sergeant. And uh, with that, I took what initiative I could to... Was this within the 199th then? Yes, within the 199th. And our particular platoon was 
assigned to headquarters and headquarters company, where there was the only infantry within that company. And uh, the rest of the units were basically infantry companies and brigades, or so forth. We were the brigade. Nonetheless, uh, while there, I uh, devised a map course, for example, that would teach people how to find direction and how to encounter obstacles along the way. And so I presented it to our platoon leader, uh, and uh, he liked it, so we did it in our platoon. It was well received, and then I was invited to do it for the brigade. So I did it for the brigade. And uh, they went through a company at a time, or a portion of a company at a time, I'd have a football field at a time, uh, rows of people. And we'd do exercises, and runs and rolls, and then they'd pick up their instructions a few at a time, and they'd go 100 feet or 1,200 feet, and they'd have to measure that distance, and so on. And they'd require snipers along the way, and if they hit, they'd go back, so forth. And it was well received. Uh, I, as a result of that, I guess, and my own initiative in other ways, was invited by a, a general from another unit to do something that was one of my uh, fondest memories of accomplishments uh, while in the service. Uh, his son had been in, uh, I think they said, five different jobs, wanted to be a cook and, and communications, etc. And he'd be told to do something, and he's always said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm the general's son. I don't have to do anything. He was a heavy, set, chunky kid who really obviously didn't do all the exercise. I never had to, I guess. But each place he was belligerent and said emphatically, no, take with you, I'm, and I'm the general son. So the general had been like the second or third generation of command in the army there. And he didn't want to get rid of his son, kick him out, but he had heard of me somehow and uh, invited me to accept him in my squad if I wanted to or not, either way is okay. But it would be his last chance, otherwise he's out of the army now. And if I wanted to accept him, then if he came around during that course of time he was with me, Wunderba, otherwise he's out of the army. Well, yeah, I care about people and, uh, and challenges, so sure, and, and, and the futures. And if I can do anything, I'll try. Uh, ordinary conversation and apparent understanding still didn't come across. He still wouldn't do anything. He was polite, but he still wouldn't carry his load. Mm -hmm. Till one day I put on a, a mock POW camp on the request of command for the brigade to go through our platoon uh, were the different Viet Cong that would be the guys in charge. So one thing I did in that, we had bleachers set up where Oh, maybe 400 at a time could see. And one thing I did with this young man is I had him dig a hole. He said, why? Just dig it, you'll know. Well, he dug a hole that was, oh, maybe seven feet deep and about that big around, around four feet around. And why, 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 you will know. And then it came time to the day before, the night before, I said, go fill it with water. So he fills it with water. Why? You'll know. So during the course of the exhibition there, a few things had happened first, and then uh, I went around to the side where uh, three or four guys from our platoon were dressed up and they had socks with socks inside them. And I told them, okay, now I want you to take him out here and bring him to the hole and beat on him with the socks, not enough to hurt him, but to illustrate what could be done and enough to get his attention of what movement is and where he is and what's going on. They did so, very good job of it. No harm or force really involved necessary. Uh, just a mock illustration kind of, and he then got to the hole. So he says, now what, Sarge? And I threw him in the hole, upside down. And he came up pretty quick. And when I saw he had to take a breath or two, and I pushed him back down. And then in a few seconds or so, he came back up again. I pushed him down one more time, I think. And then that perhaps third time, perhaps second, that he came up, uh, I didn't touch him. I just let him continue on up and hold himself on the side. And as he did so, the soldiers in the bleachers all 
were applauding. They could see that he was coming out, that he was no longer going to have to be in there, and that he'd gone through it, and they were applauding him. They were chuckling some too, but not at him, but kind of at the situation, the and but applauding him, the hundreds of them. And come on up, you know. And we go on back, and he's smiling, and he says, what more do I do? I said, that's it, you've done your part and more. Just sit down and enjoy it if you can. Well, he told me afterwards, it was the first time in his life he had ever felt like he was part of a team. Subsequently, for the next couple of weeks after that, he was still with me, he would carry his load and then he'd ask for some more. Give me some more ammo. Give me some, can I help you with that? He'd carry the M60 and ask in his own. And so that was his, his turning point. It was yeah. his turning point for sure. Mm -hmm. He thanked me for it and he was grateful for it and I was grateful for the opportunity and that it worked to a sense and I presume he stayed into the military to whatever degree that he wanted to and that after that hopefully enjoyed more life than he might have otherwise. And I suppose his dad, you know, at that point, the general, you know, knew he was going to Vietnam too and didn't want him going over untrained, if you will. Right. You know, so I think he probably had a different mentality when you all finally got into Vietnam. Yes. And I, I would think so. And he didn't stay with our unit. He went back to some other unit, which I presume was considered to be more protective. Mm -hmm. So when did you end up in Vietnam? Is it 65 or 6 by this point then? It was, uh, or at least 60 it was Thanksgiving of, uh, Thanksgiving Day of 65. Excuse me, Thanksgiving Day of 66. Thanksgiving Day. Quite a holiday. It was. Coincidentally, th coincidentally, Thanksgiving Day is when I left also, the year to the day. I went Probably over, it still has special meaning for you one way or another today, doesn't it? Very much so, yes so. Still the original feeling I had for it before, I guess, and then added to it. Where'd you end up in Vietnam? What was your first assignment there? Well, I was, uh, my first assignment was the, the NCOIC, it's the NCO in charge of our advance party to set up the tents for the brigade to come over. For and this is where? This is in a place called Long Ben. Okay, uh, surrounding city would be uh, Benoit, uh, but Long Ben is well known. There were different units in that area, but our space was just empty field, and we were supposed to then just put up the tents, which we did. Uh, during that time, there was uh, different things I learned. Uh, and were very striking, uh, the way people respond to other people dying, civilians that is, uh, and different things that I, I learned. But then when our brigade arrived, they came there between, just before Christmas. And I should say that back home in country here, our country, uh, a fellow in our, in our squad, my squad, came to me and said, Ron or Sarge, whatever, friends, uh, I've got a chance to get into another unit, into supply. I don't want to go to Vietnam particularly. I don't want to kill anybody. I don't want to get killed. What do you think I should do? I don't want to let you or the unit down. Uh, I said, do you want to do that? Is that what you think you'd like to do? I said, he says, yes. I said, then partner, that's what you should do. Because we're all on the same team and you're going to help just as much there as any other position. And we have time to replace you in our squad. You won't have any ill effect on our unit at all. You've just probably said something like you'll add to it because you're going to do something you want to do. Things along that line to encourage him. Uh, he appreciated that. He may have still done it without my uh, input, but he appreciated that I encouraged him to do that. So they came over just before Christmas. And then uh, and the tents were set up. New Year's Eve. We celebrate. It's in our nature, I guess. We live enough things in life that aren't comfortable. We celebrate 
the opportunities. New Year's Eve was one for the perimeter guard. Been in country a few days. So at midnight they fired their guns or weapons, uh, tracer bullets in the air to celebrate. Uh, not the right thing to do, but they did it. And it caught on quick and people within the perimeter started doing the same thing. Not everyone, I don't know how many hundred, but several hundred. And as they did, one fella tripped over a tent rope and the four, as I was told, and his 45 uh, hit the ground. When it did, it was discharged. He was getting ready to fire again. And it discharged and went through the supply tent and into the head into the head of our friend. Reading a book, he would never have anything to do with something of that nature. He was, he was more interested in more mature things. Perhaps you could call it that. I don't know what you'd call it. Because grown men do what they do. Sometimes it's childish, sometimes it's uh, savage, sometimes it's unintentional. And uh, people say, well, it's meant to be, that sort of thing. For me, I knew I had an influence in that and felt quite guilty about it, frankly. I still do. But I put that in a different place today, quite a lot, anyhow. But that uh, was my first assignment, if you will, uh, in country of Vietnam, was pre helping to prepare our area. I learned what, one was, thing. Was that your first experience then with the casualty, and ironically was, uh, you know, somebody you knew? Um, a casualty in the military, yes. Yeah. I've seen a civilian casualty, which is an example. I'd seen a truck roll over which had things in it, and hundreds of people, or a hundred, say, rushed down to steal what they could from the truck without checking on the guy. By the time I got there, he was dead. Not that I could have saved his life, but just expressing the environment and the attitude of people, how they respond where there's a feeling of necessity. Uh, our opportunity to to make things better. Uh, that was my first uh, assignment and a, a quick indoctrination to uh, a war-torn environment. Uh, one of the first things I thought when I got in country was, yes, there really is another side of the world, and that's just as much as I anticipated as a child. It's the opposite in census. Uh, I did things there that uh, I tried to be involved. I tried to support our country. I tried to support the South Vietnamese that were in favor of us, and vice versa, that worked together. And did quite a lot of that, but was in the infantry, and we did, uh, after our unit was sort of indoctrinated, then we started doing patrols a little bit. And then working some support unit with some larger units. And then we were moved down to uh, Cat Lai headquarters and the headquarters company was placed there, which is kind of in between Long Bend and Saigon, uh, which will always be Saigon to me. Uh, and uh, so we worked from there. And uh, largely we did night work and night ambushes. Uh, was, was Vietnam at this point, was it anything like you had expected it to be? Was it uh, worse, not as bad, um, like you thought it would be? Because uh, again, Vietnam was pretty new, I guess you, you, know, you really don't know what you're getting into at that point, I suppose. That's right. And uh, it stayed that way a lot. It stayed that way, Charlie, uh, a lot. Still didn't know what to get into. Uh, 
and, and we were learning as we went and, and responding as we went. And so much of it was dependent on response. We had, you know, I, you've heard the expression all's fair in love and war. Well, all's fair in love and war as long as the politicians get to tell you what to do in a war. For example, as many people know, or some at least, everyone who was there, we were not allowed to bomb North Vietnam. Now, North Vietnam was a considerable problem for us, but we weren't allowed to bomb them and, you know, do the best that we could or anything that we could to win the war. One restriction that bothered me a lot and, and many others uh, was uh, because we were on the river, primarily, and to shoot people that were on the river. And uh, a separate platoon, I didn't know them, but within another company, uh, was set up and they, uh, we weren't allowed to fire until six o'clock. Anything prior to six o'clock, you had to say, Light Aid, come here. And you had to check their ID, as though they couldn't get a false ID anyway. Right. But, so they come on over, and then they pull up the sides of the sandpan, the 20-foot boat, and mow them down, all 50 of them, one or two, survived. And that was an indication of where you need people that are closest to what's being done, have the ability, have the, that authority to make decisions, not just the responsibility, but the authority. That sort of thing carries over, as we know, into civilian life, and is an obstacle sometimes. Uh, so that was my first, and that was my, most of the time what we did. Uh, my last, uh, month and a half, I worked as an artist. Uh, we were sitting around, our platoon was separate, and we weren't active in the field, and so some of the things I'd do was teach Vietnamese children how to fill sandbags. Well, I knew that, I had that down pretty well, so I told the general, I gave him a, uh, a sketch I had done, and I asked him, you know, can you use a, an artist here while I'm sitting around? He said, well, yeah, that's nice, we could, but you'd be the first combat artist in Vietnam. I said, well, great, that sounds neat. And so I had a private tent and uh, uh, pretty much a jeep when I wanted it and a helicopter when I wanted it and a lot of choice on where I would go. And with that, I took a lot of leisure, not leisure, but uh, uh, opportunity that it wasn't necessarily sponsored. Uh, one thing I did was uh, I went to a village that I had heard was Viet Cong and North Vietnamese occupied. So we had been out in the, sitting in the water at tidal rivers up and down with leeches, etc. Who's comfortable in that? Nobody. But you do it. It's part of your job. And some of the time you see somebody, usually not. But all of the time you need to be prepared each second for someone to arrive. Well, I was tired of waiting for them and wanted to know more about how to get to them. So with that freedom I had as an artist, I found a way to infiltrate that village at night. And it was through a couple of people who lived there, a woman and her daughter. And the daughter claimed to be, uh, as a Tokyo Rose was in, in World War II, but for the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese now. I went with them, put on dark pajamas and a cone-shaped hat and rode in them but they call it pedicab, and we were stopped along the way and uh, allowed to go through, fired at a couple of times, not real close, but just kind of the, the environment. You always see flares in the air and gunfire in the air, it's all the time. Uh, and went to the village, and it was the village of the people that were in charge of the village. They had the only tile floor. The, the French did that in each village and gave it only to who was in charge. Dirt floor for everyone else. It was a room 20 foot by 50 feet maybe. It was the main room. I met the parents and they were cordial, gave me tea. And then we sat down, The my enemy came in. The people I've been hunting came in. About 50 of them all together. Both the pajama laden Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, uh, Viet Cong, and uniform North Vietnamese. We sat up against the wall on the floor and talked for a couple of hours. 
I ask him a question that answer. No fear? Well, I think most people have been petrified to go in and do what you did. That was overcome by a feeling of necessity. And the necessity came about because of the sense of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity came about because of my feeling of desire to know more and looking for who can I find to tell me more mm -hmm. and going outside the normal ways to do that. So you, you had already had the mindset then to show a different side of the war besides the horrors of war and what people and the images that were being fed back to, uh, you know, uh, those of us here in the States, you, you were trying to show the, uh, a more, humani more humanity, it's just a different side of the war. You'd already had this mentality then. Yes, and I had the mentality to learn everything I could still. My first night in Vietnam, my first night, I was in Long Bend. And I said a friend of supply, coincidentally, in charge of supply. I said, forget his name, but I'm going to town. Come on. Uh, oh, I don't want to go. Well, we had to sneak out, so to speak, but go into the town and see what civilian life is like a little bit. And come back at night. Well, I was by myself, and I so I go. I want to see what's going on. So it's a few miles away. You you hitchhike. You catch a cab or whatever it was, and I come back and was uh, challenged and shot at once getting him through the thing. So I wanted to know is my point. And when I went to that village, I had the same mentality. I want to know as much as I can. Yes, I want to show the civil side of a population, but that didn't exist very much when I was in the infantry. In the infantry, I primarily wanted to do my job, in which was primarily to protect the people under my command, which was 10 or 14 people varying. Right and then to do my job, of course, to do my assignments. But I wanted to do more than that. When you went out to do these, um, you, know, the, you know, the last month and a half to do, you know, these personal assignments, did you carry a sidearm, you know, under your pajamas when you went in? I mean, was there still that, you know, I gotta protect myself or just trusting? I'd carry my rifle with me on one occasion. I met uh, some Viet Cong coming back uh, from a village and they were playing a guitar and singing. And, uh, I uh, met them, they didn't shoot at me, and so I, they were in my route, so I was either going to be okay with them or uh, have combat. And I was in the middle of the street and they weren't. And so we got acquainted a little bit there. I find that if I look at someone with a sense of equality, that that can transmit to a a genuine feeling of acceptance. And acceptance of not who they have been in their lives or who they'll be, but who are you? Who are you? Tell me who you are. I, I'm interested. And I'm interested to share who I am as I can. And that changes like with everyone. And I think when we do accept each other, that's one thing we accept about each other is the change and the alternatives that we have. Vietnam posed a lot of our alternatives. It truly did. Uh, for me, uh, it was an obstacle more when I left than when I arrived. Because I, I had a, a, a feeling, a sense of responsibility. An interesting thing that happened to me uh, when my last leave home before going overseas. Uh, I was here in Denver at my home in Golden. Uh, and. Uh, with my family, and then stopped in Chicago overnight to go back to Columbus. So going back on that leg of the trip back to Columbus, I'm sitting in regular class, and early in the flight, the stewardess comes to me and says, say, would you like to come up to first class? There's a couple guys up there that would appreciate it if you'd share their lunch with them and conversation, they'd like to meet you. I was in uniform, and I said, well, who are they? Well, they're a couple of musicians, and they'd like to Share, okay, I go up and we have some conversation and they shared their meal with me. I forget if they ordered an extra one or just what. One of them sat in the floor primarily uh, and the other one most of the time in the chair, though they did switch some. The one who sat in the chair most of the time uh, uh, was uh, Simon. You ever hear Simon and Garfunkel? Oh, yeah. Of course. 
and that's who it was. No kidding. That's who it was. And each time I'd ask more about them, they'd, say, they'd answer briefly, uh, and they'd say, but we're not interested in that. We want, really want to know more about you. Just sincere. And so interesting things happen when yeah, you're aware There's aware a song to, about you somewhere in, in their music library. I have wondered if they should. It may not be just about you, but about that person that they met. Exactly, exactly. Express that point of view, kind of. Right? And so when you're willing to look, you get to look and do see things and people. And what more is there to see than people? And uh, Did you that, know it was Simon Garfunkel then? Were you a fan? So you knew who it was? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's interesting. How much did Vietnam change you, do you think? You know, when you when you know, now that you you know, and we're gonna talk about your post military career here, but just you know, quickly, uh, um, how much do you think it changed your life? Not necessarily for better or for worse, but obviously it changed your life, but how much do you think? Uh Quite a lot, did, quite a lot. Did you come home the same guys that, that went over? No. Uh, and when I leave this conversation tomorrow, I hope to be more than I am today. But uh, no, I didn't stay the same. Interesting question you ask, and it brings to mind something my mother told me, one of the last things she said when I left to come over. She said, don't let them change you. Maybe that was when I went into the military, I think. She said, you know, do what you do. I know you look after others, she said. And uh, others look after me, too. But uh, she said, be sure to look after yourself and do not let them change you. Not that she thought I was pure or perfect, but that she was my mother. And I was her son. I am her son. And she is my mother. And uh, so how did it change me? As I said, it was... Uh, more difficult leaving than arriving because I was in arriving I had a mindset that was of yes this is what I need to do and where I'm supposed to be and when I came home I felt very confused while working as an artist is when I went to a village I don't believe I mentioned that yet to you, that I went to a village and I had talked with this uh, gal that was uh, on the radio for the Viet Cong. Well, we went to the village and we sat around and uh, I got information as much as I could. I didn't give any. I, of course, we give some just by appearance. That's information, you could say. But I my awareness didn't give any information and I didn't understand or feel or see any sense of probing me. I think they were interested in telling me what they thought and one thing that they thought as did many Vietnamese is uh, as a whole they didn't want us there but they didn't want anyone else there and that's been their history for a couple thousand years of other people occupying their country and them back and forth having it themselves. So they wanted the Chinese and the, and the Russians, as I understood it from different sources uh, of civilians and military, that because they could help them depend, gain independence. So there was that clash, both gaining or claiming to get, uh, supply the same thing. How did it change me? Uh, I did what I could think of to do as a sergeant in the infantry, as an artist, I still did what I think I could do as to support our effort. The general had a sergeant from I Corps or what I don't know come by to where I was as an artist and tell me to come down to his tent and he wanted to see me down to the headquarters tent to give me some medals. I have a few medals that were just handed out, I guess, uh, for things that we did, uh, CIB and so on and so forth. Uh, basic thanks for the kind of work I did. But and for the record, the CIB is combat. Combat infantry, infantry badge. badge. Yes, you have to be in combat zone 
and in a combat situation for X number of days or whatever it is. And I had turned down the offer of a, a Purple Heart earlier. I was there a few months. Uh, I had a minor injury in my leg from a, uh, a mine. We were on patrol and I was toward the front of it and uh, uh, some kind of mine went off and uh, put a piece of steel in my thigh. And they took it out a little bit on the field and then the rest back when I got back to our camp and then the rest popped out a few years later. But it was no big deal, certainly compared to my friend in supply. Uh, and so, no thank you. Uh, I'm not interested in your putting in that application uh, to my platoon people and to the medic. And so when I was told to come down and get some medals, I had that same sentiment and told him, no thank you. Later on, I was told a week later to come down again to shine the, a lamp I'd made for General Westmoreland for our general for him to give to him as he was leaving country. Actually, I didn't make it, but I had made the components thereof in Saigon. They did a very nice job. Uh, but he wanted me to come down and shine it. I knew he didn't want me to come down and shine it. I knew that General Westmoreland was in the area, was my impression. And I thought he was wanting me to come down to accept some medals, as I was told I was going to. He wanted me to accept a Bronze Star, possibly uh, 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 something more than a Bronze Star, and for what? Well, for the different things that you had done were in the field and uh, in that infiltration and so forth. But I couldn't do it. I felt guilty about it, the idea of it, and so awkward for me, and I was so inept that I didn't even give the general an explanation. Since then, more than not receiving the medals, which I have regretted, of course, not of course, but I have in a way, but I regret the disrespect I showed him by not even responding to him. Uh, I had known him since he came in country where I had set up some things for his uh, main tent and so on and so forth. We had known each other a little bit and he was always good to me. So I disliked that about me. There's things in the service I liked and do, and that's one thing I don't like and that I keep with me. So when I left country, I didn't have a place to go except home. There was no such thing as get reacclimated. I tried to be a, a cop, a police officer with North Glen and another one, Denver, I think because I thought I could do a good job, because I was responsible not in taking lives, yes, in my job, but in protecting lives and in using judgment on situations. I thought that would be a good consideration for my work there. And so when your rotation came up then, we're in what, 67 now? Early 67, right. am I correct? Uh, yes. And uh, your rotation comes up uh, when you, uh, did you fly back in then to Denver? Yes. What was your reception like? You know, the war was still pretty new. Um, you know, of course, we all hear about what it was like when Vietnam's came home yet. Uh, did you have that chilly reception or was that, were you still early, in an early rotation where that, you know? It was, uh, no, I didn't have that, what you I think, referring you didn't have to. have a hero's welcome. Uh, no, I didn't have a hero's welcome. I was hoping to land in a public airport because I wanted to see some guy with a sign in his hand protesting the war. If he didn't say anything other than thank you, welcome home, I was going to remind him where he lived. And that was my mentality because of the thought I had for the influence, negative influence, that some people in our country, wonderful as most people were and are, had a negative impression and I didn't appreciate it. It cost lives, and it cost more than lives. Or if there is more, it cost other things too. But I landed in Travis Air Force Base, where I was escorted with the others to their checkout house, where there's nothing but military. So I think I stayed less than 24 hours and was discharged. 
So they do it right then, honorable discharge right there, and you're a civilian at that point. Right, out the gate, there's a cab. And when, when was this? Month? You, that, you was, that was Thanksgiving of 1967. So, that was, so we end Thanksgiving, back out Thanksgiving. Right. 67. And, uh, Where'd you go? I went. Back to mom and dad's? Yes, but my flight wasn't ready yet. Uh, and I went and spent the night with my aunt and uncle uh, in uh, Piedmont, California, in the, in the Bay Area. And uh, he is an accomplished uh, veteran. He was a pilot, a scout pilot, and shot down a couple of times and in the ocean for many days alone until he was recovered. But a very loyal man to our country and uh, in the war and in industry quite accomplished and uh, as an individual very accomplished but I enjoyed the stay with them it was coming from dirt floors to you, you must have been elated to be back home in the states and just uh, a whole different world again it was I was in a civilian plane where the uh, stewardesses were about twice as tall as the Vietnamese it, I'm way exaggerating but I hadn't seen uh, ladies from our country in a long while and what so was the first thing you did when you got back did you go get a cheeseburger I mean was did you go get a pizza and have a beer I mean was there something you just wanted to do when you got home cheese you're right about the cheeseburger uh, the USO in, in Saigon I had access to a little bit when I was working as an artist and they supplied a cheeseburger there uh, and uh, cheeseburger is what I was looking for and pizza Okay, I was looking mostly for my family, and they were there, and they were anxious to see me, and they were cautious about invading my space. I could sit at a table like we are now, and I couldn't say a five-word sentence without having three swear words in it. So my conversation at the table with my mother was limited and sometimes would still slip out so it took a while to get adjusted to just being around something other than a threat because even though the threat wasn't everything of course in Vietnam it was always a constant and so that was still with me and I tried going back to, to college to uh, night school at CU to see what that would be like real quick I think it was right after Christmas and it was like being in a nursery school I still have my hand on my side to support my M16 and I'm looking for my old environment and children are running around me with gibberish and I'm nervous about being in that climate and I couldn't get back into school even though writing was one course art history another simple courses it was the environment that was tough Later on in years, I tried again to get back into with photography, but that was tough. Work-wise, I couldn't find something that uh, I could settle in that was comfortable for me. I think uh, uh, there were jobs that I had that were comfortable, and elements of them, but one of the most was working as a night watchman on a golf course. I wanted to be a professional golfer, so I wanted to learn everything about golf. Now you were uh, early 20s here? Yes. 22, 21? Right. 21 when I got out. And uh, so I worked as a night watchman at, a, at the Valley Country Club south of Denver, and that allowed me complete solitude. I mean, uh, no one was there. And I had a fast cart I could drive around the course in and stick to things in and start the water and I had the opportunity to do a better job than had been done before. They had to tell me not water so much. It's not that I'm so great. I'm telling you good things about me are things that I remember a little bit that I enjoyed. Uh, and so that was one uh, that I enjoyed a lot because it gave me that privacy and at night I could do my job and have a minute or two just to think in silence in the dark. Uh, it's been very difficult to get home and at the same time it's been very difficult to leave Vietnam 
and there's something in between that I'm still yet to find. Uh, not awfully long ago, uh, I was introduced to the VA and to the Veterans Service Organization, uh, where I had never really been before much. Uh, I had had a head-on collision in 1976, and then I was putting together my photography business because that was what I thought I wanted to do. And that kept me from doing things. I was in bed for about a year. Uh, when I woke up, I was in the hospital, and, and I came out of a coma. While in a coma, I left my body. And I could see myself and feel myself from my body and people around me through the ceiling. And, and I see the Denver General beneath me at night. And as I leave our world, I see it getting smaller and smaller. And the stars now I'm more interested in as my speed increases. And the stars eventually, the, our world disappears. Now that stars are real important, then the last star disappears. I'm even faster. And I'm saying, God, please stop me. I need to go home. There's things I need to do. Nothing. Said the second time, nothing. The third time, I go like an elevator, it felt. And across from me is an image. I have no idea of the distance. There's no comparison. Uh, is an image of an oblong figure, a masculine voice that says, Ron, it's OK. Come with me. Everything will be all right. The figure's lit up, uh, very bright lights, uh, vertical and circular horizontal light going around and kind of a facial image and kind of appendages close to the body. Again, I, my request, God, please let me go home. I need to do things. Come with me, Ron. Everything will be right. The same answer. The third time, then the image just vanishes, vanishes and I'm allowed. I came back the way I did. And right through the hospital, right into my body, and I asked, there's, now there's some nurses around me. Uh, and I asked for my clothes, stay down. And they refused my clothes. And then there's some that leave and then a couple that stay. You can't get up. You're leaking cerebral spinal fluid, the fluid that surrounds your brain. That's not, uh, you don't have a runny nose. I find my clothes anyway. Then one of them runs kind of in a hurry to find some help. And the other one says, you've got to stay, look in the mirror. I had found my clothes and slipped them on. I look in the mirror. It's purple and I can see cuts and cracks. My head is cracked. It might have been cracked before it was cracked. <laughs> <laughs> so I escaped from the hospital. She said, you'll only reach the front door and you'll fall down and die for the leaking of cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid. I escaped the hospital and found many blocks away in the middle of the night uh, a phone booth and phoned a friend, can you get me? He did, I'm home, I'm in three hospitals and talked with a surgeon uh, briefly, don't get undressed, sorry, you're not gonna work on my carburetor, I don't like you, nothing against you, I just don't want you working on me. See ya, I leave. My brother had come back to help me get into, for care. Eventually I'm taken to VA hospital Little did I know there was an armed guard on the outside that I was going to stay because by then, you see, uh, my vision had changed. Uh, I was coming, walking, and uh, all of a sudden, this was before, I, after I'd left Denver General, before I was treated, they had kept me in the ER and then I left. And I stopped, it was a sunny day, and all of a sudden my left eye just started to close like a curtain. And now I don't see my left hand, for example. Now I see my fingers start to turn, a little stream of light through there. It closed and not all the way, I stopped there gratefully. And I'm wondering, this gets your attention. And now my right eye, I'm still stopped and looking straight ahead what's going on. My right eye does the same thing. And it fortunately stopped in dead center. So it's like a curtain on the right dead center and almost closed on the left dead center. I found my way back to my apartment. And uh, then I was in VA and 
They treated me there. They let me out early. I said, I'll be stay in bed. You bet I'll stay in bed. And uh, I didn't. I got a truck. I rented a truck. I could barely see, and I rented a truck and unloaded one or two storage units into my new apartment. After that, I basically collapsed and was in bed for roughly a year, where the first half of that I was asleep all but maybe an hour each day. And uh, the second half I was awake all but an hour or two. And in this time, I'm hitting the walls as I, every three feet, try to negotiate the hall once I was walking and wondering what I would do now and that my self-assigned work was to be in mountain photography. And how am I going to handle that? I can't even walk, let alone drive or get around by myself. So after a long while of trying to wonder how and figure out to try it again, uh, my mother came over one day and suggested to me, Ron, get dressed, we're going for a ride. Really? Where are we going? We're going to go get a Jeep. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we're going to go to the post office. They're selling their Jeeps. We're going to buy one for you. You're going to drive it. I can't drive. <laughs> You've seen me drive with you and my brother in the car in the mountains and uh, Don holding on to the wheel on the one side ready to and going 10 feet and crawling at a time. You know I can't drive. You never know until you try it. We did. I passed the test. Somehow I, they had cheated a little bit on the visual part. But I passed the test, and the, and the driving part I passed somehow. But the point of it Sounds is... Sounds like coming home was a lot more dangerous than Vietnam ever was. Exactly, exactly. I've had uh, two head-on collisions. I've had my gallbladder removed. I've had uh, uh, different uh, health issues. Uh, what is, I think, from the age and orange, I have uh, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, different things. Like I said, coming home is much worse. What you're going to do is in front of you. What is the consequence of that? You don't know and you wait for it to happen. And for something so monumental, there should be a monumental consequence. Well, I guess that consequence was on my family because I wasn't as much like I left and on me of course and each day that passes uh, is one I can catch if I pay attention this is something I've learned before in the military and through my family through, from other people uh, from my dear lady Phyllis who's been with me 30 years now and gone through so many uh, medical problems with me, having a cataract surgery that should be simple. I demanded that it be, take place in a hospital, gratefully, because you never know. And it did. They gave me a general. I aspirated and was in, it took them many hours and 12 people at one time. So I was still working on me to get me out of the first room in ER and you graduate in rooms. Well, things like that, that you can't be a part of our change. I, my dear Phyllis, or my fa other family as well, is more hard, of course, than it is sometimes on the individual. Uh, I was asked by a nurse one time, there isn't this terrible, you're in the hospital on your birthday. I said, no, it's not. It's great. I need to be in the hospital. What more can I ask for? It's a great gift. And so this is one thing I've taken from Vietnam, is that we need to recognize what we have and utilize what we have and share what we have. And that's what projected my interest in photography and in the way I try to live a lot. Let's talk about that a little bit, you know, as we uh, reach the end of the interview here, because, um, um, you know, I do want to get into, uh, you know, we're, we're showing some of these pictures as you've done, I, yeah, and I think, you know, the, <coughs> the pictures that uh, we've seen, um, you know, that you've taken from Vietnam that really do show a whole different side of, 
of uh, what Vietnam was all about mm -hmm. and uh, the humanity aspect of it. But um, you've really uh, taken just some amazing pictures, and you know I know you've been on the honor flight. Uh, when did you do your honor flight? Last May, so it's uh, roughly a year ago. Yeah, and again, you know the the, the picture behind you of uh, one of the soldiers at the Korean. Uh, memorial has always been one of my favorite pictures of yours and uh, I, I'm honored to uh, have it hanging on my wall today um, but uh, you 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 have shot a lot of things you you've got to, as you said pieces that are um, ironically now in the Library of Congress um, you have uh, you've been there with the Pope uh, and taken pictures of, uh, of, of, of popes um, you've really done quite a bit in from what I see, a very successful career with your photography, you know, your photography, photography business must be a um, quite an honor to, to see a, a lot of what you've seen minus Vietnam. Thank you, and uh, if I may interject there, add to that with Vietnam because it's so much of it, but separating the two is important as well because now is now, and it's only then that we notice. The uh, the pictures that I've taken since Vietnam have been ones also to express something, to tell something. I like for people to see a photograph of mine, and thank you for your compliment about the Korean picture. And of course, it's a, a compliment and an observation of what they've done and that represents what soldiers are doing and have and will. But to be able to capture that, if you will, on a still image where people can stop our movement and look at it to look for what we can see within the, the still, within the exact, and from that relate to it. I want people to look at one of my pictures and to be able to put themselves inside of it. And if they once inside it, no telling where they can go, it will, and how far, it's not limited. And so it's, it's a vehicle that I'm proud to be a part of. So far as being greatly successful, uh, I feel I have been greatly successful in photography. I know I have. I have some pictures I'm quite proud of, and I have some efforts and involvements that perhaps I'm even more proud of. Uh, do, you, do you have a website or anything that uh, where these are housed, or how do you how do you market those? You just go around to shows, or I mean, do you have a website? Yes, I do have a website, and in connection with my success, it's been in taking pictures, not in selling them. <laughs> so I've put up an initial website, and it's uh, on the uh, artist website of uh, uh, artist of. If I may ask you, uh, Phyllis, do you? See how much I use my website? We'll, we'll, we'll find it and put it in. Uh, but we'll, nonetheless, but you do have a website. I have a website, and it will be uh, adjusted and, and updated and uh, made better. And the website, again, is for something to see and then take things from. What were you starting to say? No, I would just, would just, I'm just you know, curious that, uh, if you had a website, because we want to put the link up so that people can access some of your stuff. Cause uh, we won't be able to show it all in this interview, and I think it's important for people to really see a lot of this. Um, you know, a lot of these pictures really you know, describe who you are and what you've been through and what you've seen. I think you know the picture's worth a thousand words, and um, you know, and it. Uh, so we want to make sure that we show a lot of these because uh, you know I want people to be able to, you know, if they choose to do so, have access to that. So, you know, later, how about your folks? When did you lose your folks? Excuse me. Uh, my father had passed away uh, uh, less than a year after I returned from Vietnam, back in 1968. Uh, is when he passed away uh, very unexpectedly, and uh, he uh, contributed a lot in my life, all of my life. He included me in his life, and uh, my mother. Uh, she passed away a few years ago at the age of 100. Wow. Yeah. You're in Colorado? No, she lived in, in Colorado, in Evergreen, uh, most recently, uh, and in the Denver area, 
all of her life in, in Evergreen most of the time that we've been here, in Golden, of course. And when she passed away, it was in Nevada. She was visiting my brother and fell there and broke her hip. Uh, those things happened. Okay, she was, <coughs> excuse me, 99 at the time. And uh, so, uh, what do you do with a broken hip? I've had one, and you have choices. Especially 99. Exactly. The surgeon said he would not even consider a choice if it, at her age if it weren't for her constitution. So he talked to my brother and I about it. And we and the choices were, in his opinion, that <coughs> excuse me, with the replacement, she had activity at least in a wheelchair. Without it, she's bedfast. And so my brother and I had an opinion that she should probably have the surgery if, of course, she wanted to. And so we discussed it with her, not to tell her our opinions, but to find out hers. And before we told her ours, she so said that she wanted to have it done and why. And it made good sense and we all agreed and she did. And she recovered from that in a sense. Uh, but it allowed her mobility. And it's kind of like the person that she was when at 99. Uh, when she fell once, in, still in her 90s, and broke her, her, uh, her arm, she, she wanted to continue the outing of gathering uh, some nice leaves from the fall uh, before going to the doctor. Not because she's loony, but because she wanted the experience not to go away. She was actually quite bright. Um, how about your brother? Married? Uh, does he have kids? Um, he's in Nevada? Uh, yes, he's now actually in California and married. And uh, my brother has, uh, uh, maybe to his chagrin, but to my pride, he has more than one wife that he's had. <laughs> but along the way, and his first wife, he's had uh, three children, three lovely girls, which I treasure. So you guys still keep in touch on it? On a yes, basis. we do. And then another uh, child that's come along since then. Uh, which I love as much, of course. And how about yourself? I, I know that you mentioned you've been with uh, um, your lovely lady Phyllis for 30 years. Uh, any children? Not on my part, no. Phyllis has a young man who's, compared to me, young, ready to graduate from the Marines pretty soon, get ready to Very retire. Good. And the daughter who was in the Marines for a while, as she's in the farming industry in Iowa now, and then another daughter uh, on the West Coast uh, who's doing well. No, no children from No yourself. children from myself, though. And uh, maybe that's one reason. I don't know the reasons all relate to each other, kind of, but as a, as a consequence, I, I love children and I enjoy watching them. Uh, as I said, I, I have peripheral neuropathy and I, in a grocery store I'll use an electric cart uh, most of the time. In doing so, you have more eye-level contact with a child than mm -hmm. when you're up above them, and they know it before you do, because when you see them, you see them looking at you. And they're smiling, they're not crying. And they want to drive that cart, and they want to talk with you, your, their size kind of. So in a sense, you can relate to them, and for what they're waving to you, without provocation on my part, from me at least, and that sort of thing. It's a, a vehicle to communicate. And when that happens, use it. I, I enjoy experience, and maybe that's how I've lived a lot, is to not necessarily find something I intended to stay with, but to see what it was at the time and find and value where it was. I'm going to reel you back because I don't want you to squirt, uh, skirt the, uh, um, the question I was getting ready to ask that I think you probably know, and I know that I've talked to Phyllis, um, and I'm not going to ask why, because it's none of my business, but if you were to ask her to marry her, she would say yes. It's never too late. I'm just going to let it go at that. Well, I'm not going to get personal. I'm not going to dive into the reasons why. But uh, my uh, my feelings uh, is that uh, after 30 years, you probably know somebody pretty well. I'm just going to leave it at that. But I'm guessing that uh, her answer would probably be yes. What advice do you have? For the younger generation, um, you know, I know that um, um, you know when you look at uh, the, when you look at the younger generation today. Of course, we're so consumed in the digital age now uh, compared to 
the philosophy that you grew up with, obviously, you know, your parents instilled great value in you. Uh, what, what, would, what is your advice for the younger generation today? Well expressed uh, uh, questions. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is to recognize the present and within the present find value. And when finding value, find a place to use it. And when you find a place to use it, get involved with it. And when you get involved with it, do the best you can to make it the best it can be. And with it, enjoy the ride. Very well spoken. Very well spoken. Uh, anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to, to touch on? Um, you know, I know we could sit here all day and, and discuss this, and uh, I know you're full of thoughts, but um, you know, I want to give you a, a final opportunity in case I missed something that uh, was really important to you um, uh, pre-military, uh, military, post-military. Post just want to give you a final opportunity to uh, mention anything that I may have forgotten that you want to touch on. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, a couple of things, I suppose. One thing that first comes to mind, actually it was second, but at my mother's funeral, uh, in recognizing her and her contributions to us all, uh, one thing I saw and do still uh, is love. Where it exists, then other things happen. And some things don't happen that you'd like to prevent, perhaps. But the value of love and the potential of love. Uh, and you brought up a point about Phyllis and I, which I appreciate you doing. I do. Thank you for that. <laughs> and the way you've presented that question, uh, that opportunity for a question. Uh, I, I'd like this opportunity for another question and another answer. And I answer, question, answer. Answer from for you is Phyllis and I once had almost gotten married, if you want to put it that way. We had uh, plans on where the wedding would take place, the, uh, everything. And then uh, financial things got in the way and the practicality of doing it then diminished with the financial problems. And for that reason, I think is the reason alone that it was postponed. Now, this coincides with my advice for anyone. And at that time, my mother was still alive. And she even knew that the wedding was forthcoming and looking forward to it. And so I can't diminish the strong feelings and appreciation and love that she had at that point in time. You can't take anything away, but things change and that's what changed. And for our families and our friends that were expecting that, it was changed to be postponed. And that was an opportunity, even though it had the difficulties to it and some that came up and say they're a wall. Well, there's ways around that wall. You don't live with anyone for very long and not learn that. So for things that are very important, you should be able to realize there is. I'm try to be a perfectionist sometimes, whatever that is. I've learned that for me it's the best definition is the effort to be a perfectionist, not the achievement thereof. Because the the goal for it changes as soon as you've achieved it. So it's a constant thing. But within this interview, I'd like to address that point that you brought out. And it brings up something for myself and for Phyllis and for some other people that we are connected with, our families, 
but in general it's a point that I think people need to realize and that is this day is never going to happen again it's they say sometimes it's what you make of it well that's not always true sometimes it's just what it makes of you but one of the things it always is is if you can find it you can find what to do with it and where you belong within that and you can see that yes it's true now is when it's true not that it might be or it maybe it was with that said I'd like to do something that's been on my mind for a long time and that's uh, this may be called a table some might call it a platform others might say it's only a piece of wood others see that it's a piece of art so one thing can have different titles to it but it remains the same thing with Phyllis and I our closeness has been that and will be that and in the future I hope that it doesn't change in that way but I expect that it will change and evolve and in a good direction and to assist that and to help us be in a better position to do that I'd like to now right now this absolute time <laughs> ask Phyllis over there if you will be my wife and we'll figure out a way to overcome any financial problems or any obstacles with our whatever that's outside us and direct it, our attention to us and what we know we are and what we know we can be. I love you. And if you'll have me, be careful, this is on tape. If you'll have me, dear. I'd be so honored if you will officially, not just in words, but it officially, not just in our hearts, but officially as well, with the punctuation on the end, be my lovely wife still. Will you marry me soon? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Will you come here, please? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I love you very much, and I could not have done without you. You know that. Same here. Well, we're a good, we're a good team. We are, and we're going to continue to make that better. That's right. Part of it's come about because of the opportunity that came to us today. We need to see those opportunities even when other people aren't around. And when, of course, they are. And share it together. Live our individual lives to be the people we know we are and can and want. And to be able to share it together as if we're one, as we've really always been. That's correct. I don't know how Thank to uh, add to that. So uh, did not see that coming. I don't think you probably did either. And, and uh, um, wow. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, uh, take the time to thank you both for uh, you know, taking your time out today. Uh, Mr. Britton, again, uh, thank you for sharing your story. Um, the way this ended was kind of unexpected, and I hope you know that I was just kind of ribbing you about the, uh, <laughs> the marriage thing, but um, I told you she would say yes, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honored to have been a part of this and to see this, and uh, like you said, we've got it on record, so. That's right. Going uh, to the Library of Congress, so now you... <laughs> not, you know, and someday the great-grandkids and their great-grandkids, and uh, they'll all know how it came to be, so uh, we thank you for your time greatly. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. Not to mention what you're doing for others. 
it's extraordinary what can happen when people choose to be involved and how you affect others. You, you do a great job and you've affected us a lot. You've changed our lives a lot. You've helped our lives. That's the truth. Thank you for that. That, uh, that means a lot, uh, especially coming from, you know, uh, just honorable people in general, but veterans especially, you know, since uh, you, you know how I feel about that. So uh, coming from, you know, people like you means, means a lot. And uh, um, uh, it's, uh, it's well received, you know, as well. And uh, fills my heart. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Glad yeah. to have you together. That will conclude the uh, interview here today with uh, uh, Sergeant Britton. Uh, Vietnam veteran and uh, just been a pleasure and uh, thank you again for, for being a part of this project. You're entirely welcome, sir. Appreciate what you're doing and the others.